Hey everyone, welcome back to Lead Journey. Today we have an exciting video lined up for all the aspiring Java developers out there. Whether you are a recent graduate or a seasoned professional, mastering Java interview questions is crucial for landing that dream job. So without further ado, let's dive into the most asked Java interview questions and how to tackle them with confidence. What is the difference between JDK, JRE and JVM? JDK stands for Java Development Kit. The JDK is a software development kit that provides tools necessary for developing, compiling and debugging Java applications. It includes the Java compiler, Java C, the Java Virtual Machine, JVM, and various libraries and utilities needed for Java development. The JDK is primarily used by developers to write and compile Java code. JRE stands for Java Runtime Environment, and it is a software package that is required to run Java applications. It includes the JVM, core libraries, and other runtime components necessary for executing Java programs. JRE does not contain the tools and utilities needed for Java development, so it's used by end users who only want to run Java applications on their machines. JVM is the Java Virtual Machine. It is the runtime environment in which Java bytecode is executed. It provides an abstraction layer between the Java code and the underlying hardware and operating system. The JVM interprets and executes the Java bytecode, allowing Java applications to be platform independent. It handles tasks such as memory management, garbage collection, and bytecode interpretation. The JVM is part of JDK and the JRE. What are the main principles of object-oriented programming? The main principles are encapsulation, inheritance, polymorphism, abstraction, and composition. Encapsulation refers to the bundling of data and methods together into a single unit called an object. It allows the object to control the access to its internal state and ensures that the data is accessed and modified only through defined methods. Encapsulation helps in achieving data hiding, abstraction, and modularity. Inheritance allows the creation of new classes based on existing classes. The derived classes inherit the properties and behaviors of the parent class, which promotes code reuse and facilitates the creation of hierarchical relationships. Inheritance supports the concept of generalization and specialization. Polymorphism means the ability of objects of different classes to respond to the same message or method invocation. It allows objects of different classes to be treated as objects of a common superclass, enabling code to be written that can work with objects of multiple types. Polymorphism helps in achieving code flexibility, extensibility, and modularization. Abstraction involves simplifying complex systems by representing essential features while hiding unnecessary details. It focuses on defining interfaces and behaviors without specifying the implementation. Abstraction helps in managing complexity, enhancing modularity, and providing a clear separation between the interface and the implementation. Composition refers to the construction of complex objects by combining simpler objects. Composition promotes code reuse, modularity, and flexibility, as objects can be easily composed and decomposed. Explain the difference between abstraction and encapsulation. The main purpose of abstraction is to provide a simplified and generalized view of an object or system, making it easier to understand, manage, and modify. It helps in reducing complexity, improving code reusability, and promoting a modular design. By encapsulating data within a class, we can control how it is accessed, modified, and validated. This helps in maintaining data integrity, enforcing business rules, and preventing unauthorized access. Encapsulation also allows the internal implementation of an object to change without affecting other parts of the program that use the object, as long as the interface remains unchanged. In summary, 
Abstraction is about simplifying and generalizing complex systems by focusing on relevant aspects, while encapsulation is about bundling data and methods together, hiding the internal implementation, and providing control access to the object state. Both concepts are important for creating well-structured, modular, and maintainable software systems. What is polymorphism in OOP? It is a fundamental concept that allows objects of different classes to be treated as objects of a common superclass. It refers to the ability of an object to take on many forms. Polymorphism is achieved through inheritance where subclasses inherit the properties and behaviors of a superclass. Subclasses can then override or extend the methods defined in the superclass to provide their own implementations. There are two types of polymorphism. The first one is compile time polymorphism, also known as method overloading. It is resolved at compile time based on the number, types and order of the arguments passed to a method. Overloading consists in methods with the same name but with different type of arguments or a different number of arguments. The second kind of polymorphism is runtime polymorphism, also known as method overriding. This type of polymorphism is resolved at runtime based on the actual type of the object being referenced. Method overriding occurs when a subclass provides its own implementation of a method that is already defined in its superclass. What does immutable mean? How do you make something immutable? In Java, immutable refers to objects whose state cannot be modified after they are created. Immutable objects are useful in the following scenarios. Thread safety, simplifying code, enabling efficient caching. Here is how to create immutable Java objects. Declare the class as final to prevent subclassing and overriding methods that could modify the object state. When a class is final, it cannot be subclassed or extended by other classes. If a class tries to extend a final class, a compilation error will be shown. Declaring a class as final implicitly means that all methods are final as well. Make sure all fields in class are defined as final to prevent their values from being changed after object creation. Avoid adding methods that modify the object state. Instead, initialize the object's field through the constructor. Encapsulate fields by declaring them as private so values cannot be accessed or modified directly from outside the class. Ensure deep immutability. So if a class contains mutable objects as fields, ensure they are also immutable. And to achieve that you can use the immutable version of those objects or provide copies of those objects during construction to avoid sharing mutable references. Don't allow subclasses to override methods. If you cannot declare the class as final, make sure to design methods that cannot be overridden by subclasses to ensure immutability. This can be achieved by declaring methods as final. And lastly, implement defensive copying. When returning an immutable field from the object, make sure to return a copy of it instead of the actual reference. This prevents the caller from modifying the internal state. What is the purpose of unit tests and what are the advantages? The purpose of unit tests is to verify the correctness of individual units, components or modules of software code. Unit tests focus on a small isolated piece of code, such as function or method, and they check if they behave as expected under various conditions. The primary goal of unit tests are detecting defects early before they propagate down the development process, ensuring code correctness, enabling code refactoring and maintenance, and promoting modular and reusable code. Unit tests also serve as executable documentation that describe how a particular unit of code works, how it should behave, and provides example of its usage. And finally, having unit tests boosts confidence in code changes, as unit tests provide a level of confidence when making changes or introducing new features. What is the importance of data transfer objects? 
Data transfer objects are objects used to transfer data between different layers of components of an application. They are typically used in software architectures where data needs to be transferred between remote systems, across network boundaries, or between different layers of an application, such as presentation layer, business layer, and data access layer. The main purpose of using DTOs is to decouple the internal representation of data from its external representation. They help in reducing the amount of data sent over the network by only including the necessary fields required by the receiving component. DTOs can also be used to aggregate data from multiple sources or to transform the data into a format suitable for the receiving component. How would your system handle the failure of an API it is dependent on? When a system relies on an API, it is crucial to handle the failure of the API in a graceful and robust manner to ensure stability of the overall system. We can achieve this by monitoring and detection. Implement robust monitoring and health check mechanisms to detect failures or unavailability of the API. These can be periodic pings, canaries, or alarms on metrics. Graceful degradation. Identify critical and non-critical dependencies on the external API and determine alternative strategies or fallback mechanisms for each case. Non-critical features can be temporarily disabled or replaced with alternative approaches to maintain system functionality. Retry mechanism. Implement a retry mechanism with an exponential backup strategy to handle transient failures. Caching. Implement caching mechanisms to store responses from the API for a certain period of time. This allows the system to serve cache data when the API is unavailable, minimizing impact on user experience. Keep into account the potential inconsistencies though. Error handling and fallbacks. Implement robust error handling strategies to handle API failures. Provide informative error messages to users or logging errors for troubleshooting. Consider implementing fallback mechanisms or redundant APIs to provide a backup option in case the primary API fails. Alerting and notifications. Set up alarms to promptly notify system administrator or relevant stakeholders when the API fails or experiences prolonged downtime. Documentation and communication. Clearly document the dependencies on the API and how failures are handled in the system. This could be written in a RAM book. How do you make sure that the code you have written works? This involves a combination of testing and debugging. The first way is unit testing. Write test cases to verify correctness of individual functions or units of code. Ensure to cover different scenarios and edge cases. Integration testing. Test the interaction between different components or modules of your code base. System testing. Test the entire system as a whole, including its dependencies and external services if applicable. Automated testing. Implement automated testing frameworks or tools to streamline the testing process. And finally, use manual testing. What is dependency injection in Java? Dependency injection is a software design pattern in OOP to achieve loose coupling between classes and promote better code maintainability, testability, and reusability. In dependency injection, dependencies of a class are injected into it rather than being created or managed within the class itself. These are the different ways of implementing dependency injection in Java. Constructor injection. In this approach, dependencies are provided through a class's constructor. The class declares its dependencies are parameters in the constructor, and the caller is responsible for providing the instances of those dependencies. Setter injection. With setter injection, the dependencies are set through setter methods. The class declares setter methods for its dependencies and the caller can invoke those methods to provide the necessary dependencies. Interface injection. Interface injection involves defining an interface that declares methods for injecting dependencies. The class implementing the interface can be provided with the dependencies through those methods. What is the difference between a reference type and a value type? In Java, all objects and enums are reference types. 
and all primitives are value types. What are the differences between heap and stack memory in Java? To run an application in an optimal way, JVM divides memory into stack and heap memory. Whenever we declare new variables and objects, call a new method, declare a string, or perform similar operations, JVM designates memory to these operations from either stack memory or heap space. Stack memory in Java is used for static memory allocation and the execution of a thread. It contains primitive values that are specific to a method and references to objects refer from the method that are in a heap. Heap space is used for the dynamic memory allocation of Java objects and JRE classes at runtime. New objects are always created in heap space and the references to these objects are stored in stack memory. These objects have global access and we can access them from anywhere in the application. Stack memory has size limits depending upon the operating system and it is usually smaller than heap, whilst there is no size limit on the heap. Define a wrapper class in Java. The wrapper class in Java provides the mechanism to convert primitives into objects and objects into primitives. As the name suggests, wrapper classes are objects encapsulating primitive Java types. What is a singleton class in Java and how to implement a singleton class? A singleton is a class that can possess only one object at a time. To create a singleton class, we need to make sure that the class has only one object and we need to give global access to that object. A class can be made singleton by making its constructor private. Explain Java string pool. A collection of strings in Java's heap memory is referred to as Java string pool. In case you try to create a new string object, JVM first checks for the presence of the object in the pool. If available, the same object reference is shared with the variable, else a new object is created. What is an exception in Java? An exception is an event that disrupts the normal flow of a program during runtime. Differentiate between checked and unchecked exceptions. Checked exceptions are checked at compile time and the programmer is forced to handle them. Unchecked exceptions are not checked at compile time. How does the try catch block works? Code within the try block is monitored for exceptions. If an exception occurs, it is caught in the catch block allowing for graceful handling. Explain the concept of finally block. The finally block contains code that will be executed whether an exception occurs or not, making it suitable for cleanup operations. What is multithreading? Multithreading is the concurrent execution of multiple threads, allowing for better resource utilization. How can you create a thread in Java? Threads can be created by extending the thread class or implementing the runnable interface. Discuss the concept of synchronization. Synchronization prevents multiple threads from accessing shared resources simultaneously, avoiding data inconsistency issues. Explain the difference between array list and linked list. Array list uses a dynamic array, while linked list uses a doubly linked list. The array list is better for random access, while linked list is efficient for frequent insertions and deletions. And that wraps up our guide to mastering the most asked Java interview questions. Remember, preparation is key. Take the time to review these concepts, practice coding, and gain confidence in your abilities. I hope you found this video useful. If you did, leave some feedback in the comment box below. If you found this video useful, please like and subscribe. Also check out my YouTube channel, you're gonna find many more lead code questions and other videos that I hope you're gonna find useful to prepare for your technical interviews. Thank you.